Hi all. So today I'm going to answer a private message I received a few days ago. I asked the person who sent it whether I could use their name, but never received a response. So I'll cut it out while retaining the message itself. Keep in mind that I'm neither a mathematician or a scientist, so this is my best attempt at answering a question that I really hadn't thought about before in regards to apologetics. Feel free to correct me in the comment section if I mess up, or just let me know what you thought about the video in general. Let's get started, shall we? Not only the believers, but the atheists as well, can be closed-minded. It is not that only believers are closed-minded, there are lots of atheists and non-believers who are closed-minded as well. I will give just one example here. Well, yeah, I mean, anyone can be closed-minded, atheists included. I'm not sure why they would bother to say this, since I would never make the claim that atheists, along with any other group of people, are not capable of being closed-minded. But let's get to their example, which I thought was the interesting bit. In one YouTube video comment section, someone argued that God does not exist because God is neither in space nor in time. For him, in order to exist, someone or something must have to be in space and time. I would agree with that. To say this entity is outside of space and time is to say it exists at no time and no place. It just doesn't make sense. So what was your solution to this problem? In reply, I wrote to him that there is an instance in nature that something can still exist even if it is neither in space nor in time. Huh, do tell. In SR, it has been shown that both the travel distance and the travel time become zero for light. So long SR is not replaced by some other better theory, we will have to accept that its mathematical equations are correct and that therefore whatever conclusions can be drawn from these equations are also correct. Okay, so I don't know really what SR stands for, but he's not entirely wrong about the nature of light. Although it is a bit more complicated than he or she makes it out to be. But let's see what else they have to say before I attempt to explain the intricacies of light. So as per SR, a photon originating in a distant star and coming towards Earth will be neither in space nor in time during its total transition period, which may be anything, even billions of years, depending on the distance of the star from the Earth. Alright, let me stop you right there so we can dig a little further into what you're claiming here. First off, you use time in your <laughs> example saying that even billions of years, depending on the distance of the star from the Earth. To say that it's neither in time or space isn't necessarily correct. First off, it's true that light wouldn't experience time if it were conscious or carried a watch while on its travels. Then again, the watch wouldn't be able to travel at the speed of light because it would require infinite amounts of energy to do so, but that's another story. In other words, from light's perspective, it doesn't experience time, but to an observer, it does. For example, it takes approximately 8 minutes and 20 seconds for a photon emitted from the surface of the sun to reach the pale blue dot that we call home. If the sun mysteriously went out right now, we wouldn't even know it for another 8 minutes and 20 seconds. How freaky is that, right? If Bionic Dance is watching this, I'm deeply sorry, but it has to be done. I'll make it up to you later. Just hang in there. Cue the Shatner. What happens to a photon? from 13 billion point 800 million years that comes this way and enters my eye so I can see it. Why? Where is, where is space in, involved in that? Um, it entered your eye at a time and at a place right here. So just because a photon doesn't experience time, and since it's not conscious it can't experience anything anyways, doesn't mean it's outside space and time as many theists claim their god is. When your eye absorbs the photon, it does so at a particular place and time. Here's some more clarification, and something I found pretty awesome. In 1905, Einstein put forth his theory of special relativity, noting that the failed Michelson-Morley experiment and the phenomena of length, contraction, and time dilation would all be explained if the speed of light in a vacuum were a universal constant. C. This means that the faster something moves, the closer to the speed of light it moves. Someone watching it at rest will see their own times and distances as normal, but someone riding the fast-moving object will see that they traveled a shorter distance, and traveled for a shorter amount of time than the observer who remained at rest. In fact, when you make that 8-minute walk to the store, thanks to Einstein's relativity, the time on your watch, assuming it was super accurate and matched the shopkeeper's watch exactly before you left, would now read just over 7 femdoseconds behind the shopkeeper's watch. The effects of relativity, even though they're small under most circumstances, are always at play. The reason is because things don't just move through space, and they don't just move forward in time. It's because space and time are linked as part of a unified fabric, space-time. I don't know, I just find that so fascinating. The idea that we're in some ways micro-time travelers when we walk, as long as we're walking towards a stationary object, is just awesome. But I hope it's become clear to the watcher of this video, particularly the messenger if they're watching, that light, energy, and or photons do not operate outside of time. But what about space? After all, photons, also known as light, doesn't have any mass. Everyone knows that, right? Well, not so fast. 
it doesn't seem to be as cut and dry as you'd expect. Here's what I mean. Let's try to unmuddle the mess and start by asking a different question altogether. Do photons have mass? Photons are the smallest measure of light, and no, they don't have mass. So that's easy, right? Light is composed of photons which have no mass, so therefore light has no mass and can't weigh anything. Not so fast. Because photons have energy, and as Einstein taught us, energy is equal to the mass of a body, multiplied by the speed of light squared, how can photons have energy if they have no mass? Actually, what Einstein was proving is that energy and mass could be the same thing. All energy has some form of mass. Light may not have rest or invariant mass, the weight that describes the heft of an object. But because of Einstein's theory, and the fact that light behaves like it has mass, in that it's subject to gravity, we can say that mass and energy exist together. In that case, we'd call it relativistic mass. Mass when an object is in motion, as opposed to at rest. So our answer is a grab bag of yeses and noes. Does light have a mass that can be weighed on the bathroom scale? Most certainly not, but it is a source of gravitational fields, so we could say that a box of light weighs more than a box without light. As long as you're comfortable understanding that the weight you're measuring is a form of energy and not, say, pounds or kilograms. Pretty interesting, right? And we also know that light is affected by things like black holes, and here's why. Since light ordinarily travels on a straight line path, light follows a curved path if it passes through a strong gravitational field. This is what is meant by curved space. This is why light becomes trapped in a black hole. In 1919, a team led by Sir Arthur Eddington proved Einstein's theory when they observed the bending of starlight when it traveled close to the sun. This was the first successful prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity. One way to picture this effect of gravity is to imagine a sheet of rubber stretched out. Imagine that you put a heavy ball in the center of the sheet. The weight of the ball will bend the surface of the sheet close to it. This is a two-dimensional picture of what gravity does to space-time in four dimensions. Now take a little marble and send it rolling from one side of the rubber sheet to the other. Instead of the marble taking a straight path to the other side of the sheet, it will follow the contour of the sheet as curved by the weight of the ball in the center. This is similar to how the gravitational field created by an object, the ball, affects light, the marble. So, if light were indeed outside space and time, why is it affected by space, by the area of space-time it happens to inhabit at that given time? Since gravity can affect the path that light takes, it very clearly traveled through a specific space at a specific time and was drawn into the black hole. Even our sun bends starlight when it travels close to it. Okay, let's get back to the message. They end it by saying this. But due to this reason that light is neither in space nor in time during the transition, we can say that light does not exist because we can see the star. Twice, my comment was deleted, so I posted it for the third time and then only it was answered. The reply was that the mathematics of SR is wrong because it contradicts our observation. As we can see the light, it, so it must be in some space-time. So I had to write to him that if he had any new theory that could replace SR, then he should present it to the peers and get it accepted. This comment was also deleted, so I cannot accept that only believers are closed-minded. Non-believers can also be closed-minded. Well, even if you were correct, and I think I've shown why that's unlikely, you'd have to prove that something conscious could travel at the speed of light constantly for your god to even be remotely believable. I've never seen anything or heard of anything that is conscious that doesn't involve solid matter. Maybe you have some new information that would show this possible, but until then I'm not buying what you're selling, unless you want to claim your god is not conscious, at which point I see no reason to worship it, and I certainly wouldn't bestow it with the title of god. Oh, and I just wanted to include this to make up for the Shatner bit. For you Star Wars fans. The discovery, Lucan said, runs contradictory to decades of accepted wisdom about the nature of light. Photons have long been described as massless particles, which don't interact with each other. Shine two laser beams at each other, he said, and they simply pass through one another. Photonic molecules, however, behave less like traditional lasers and more like something you might find in science fiction. The lightsaber. Most of the properties of light we know about originate from the fact that photons are massless and that they do not interact with each other, Lucan said. What we have done is to create a special type of medium in which photons interact with each other so strongly that they begin to act as though they have mass, and they bind together to form molecules. This type of photonic bound state has been discussed theoretically for quite a while, but until now it hadn't been observed. Science. Always more reliable and satisfying than faith. Anyways, that about wraps up this video. If your brain doesn't hurt enough yet, there's a bunch of links to reading materials on this subject down in the description box below. It's all pretty interesting stuff. Then again, maybe it's just interesting to me. I'm weird like that. I hope you enjoyed the video and let me know your thoughts. Take care and cheers!